Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very fortunate to have on the podcast Neil Shubin. Neil is a paleontologist and evolutionary biologist. He is the Robert Bensley Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago and the Associate Dean for Academic Strategy of the University's Biological Sciences Division. He has his PhD in Organismic and Evolutionary Biology from Harvard. And he is the author of a few books, uh, one of the kind of instant classics, Your Inner Fish, A Journey into the 3.5 Billion Year History of the Human Body. He is also the author of The Universe Within, The Deep History of the Human Body, and his more recent book, some assembly required decoding four billion years of life from ancient fossils to dna uh, we talk about pretty much uh, we talk about the your inner fish the content from from that book and from uh, some assembly required but we talk just really about his uh, life's work and his research of what he's uh, what he has been doing what he continues to do we start the conversation by talking about why the fossil record is so essential for understanding the history of the Earth and the history of past and present organisms. We talk about the importance of him and his team's discovery of Tiktaalik, uh, that's a 375 million year old fossil, which is essentially an intermediary uh, species between fish and land animals, which is one of the most puzzling and difficult uh, periods to understand how uh, animals came from water to land. And so he's the expert on on this period and, and many of these um, animals in this time frame. We talk about the four arches that make up all heads and use some of the examples from embryology. We talk about the continuity of ears and eyes. We discuss uh, Darwin's uh, key phrase by a change of function and what that looks like and how uh, evolution sometimes doesn't, uh, it can, you can already have organs uh, within one organism and uh, how someone's change in a function can be the key element, uh, not necessarily getting new parts or new organs or anything like that. We talk about the importance of embryonic comparison, talk about DNA and genes and how they're important for change in function. We talk about the sonic hedgehog gene various uh, folks that have contributed to cell biology and we talk about the future of the human body and where where are we headed in our evolutionary journey i have to say that uh, it was such an honor to have neil on the podcast he's you know brilliant uh, really really important uh, scientist for for us as humans and he's a, a really 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 nice guy and I had an absolute blast uh, talking with him. So now I bring you Neil Schumann. I'm here with the uh, one and only Neil Schubin. Neil, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, looking forward to this. Thank you. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, of course. Um, you have written a few books, uh, most of which I have uh, read. Uh, Your Inner Fish is one of them. Some Assembly Required, uh, both, all, or I think all your books now are in uh, uh, paperback, and um, they're all brilliant. So uh, I, um, I'm excited to talk about some of them. So just tell folks who you are, what you do, uh, what your research is in, and uh, all, the, all the particulars. So my name is Neil Shupin. I'm a professor at the University of Chicago, where I teach and research evolutionary biology. Um, and I'm interested as a scientist in the great transitions in evolution. You know, how did the big steps in evolution happen? How did our world come into being, you know, our physical and biological world? And the tools to do that, which we specialize in as, as scientists, are um, paleontology and geology, going to find fossil evidence of the history of life but also genetics and development and embryos when we compare them among living creatures uh, to tell us about, you know, the structures and living creatures and how they're similar and how they're different. I think uh, one of the important things that you discuss in uh, mostly, I think in your inner fish, but I think in all of your books is um, why, just as you said, the fossil record is important, why genetics are important. And when I, when I think of your work, I always think of uh, you're kind of one of the, the pioneers of explaining how did we get from uh, water to land and how did, how did we do that, that period. And, and you've made some pretty remarkable 
uh, discovery. So we'll we'll get into some of that. So I guess uh, one question is is just about the fossil record. Many people, uh, you know, obviously look at the fossil record. You know, different people from different disciplines. I guess what what is the most important thing, and how reliable can we put? Um, many of our hypotheses or the evidence from the, the fossil record to understand the earth or to understand uh, various organisms. Why is that so important and how much uh, strength can we put in the fossil record? The fossil record is really a, a unique source of information because you can, if you know how to look, you can crack into rocks and find evidence of the distant past, you know, and it's, it's really, tr- I, mean, I mean, just think about that for a second. Think about how wondrous that is yeah. that you can sort of find physical objects that tell us about the history of the world now the fossil record itself um you know is basically have layers of rock of different ages and we you know we crack into there to find fossils that tell us about the the history of different groups of organisms and it has its gaps and it's always going to have certain gaps so certain kinds of tissues get preserved in the fossil record more than others bone and teeth are hard parts they tend to get preserved much more readily than soft tissues like skin and, and organs and so forth. So we have a record that's very tilted towards, you know, towards skeletons and teeth. Um, also, certain kinds of creatures, you know, get get um, get preserved better than others because because their environments are preserved. You know, that certain kinds of environments make it into the fossil record. You know, so when you think about the fossil record, uh, it takes a lot of luck to become a fossil. You know, <laughs> I mean, you have to. The creature has to die. It has to be preserved in just the right way. Then it has to be, you know, buried in just the right way with the right water going through it. So there's a lot of conditions that have to happen uh, for a fossil to be uh, to be preserved. But what's remarkable to me is that, given all of that, we still have an amazing record in certain places. We have gaps in others. We have an amazing record in, in certain places, and we can predict where to look, mm-hmm. likely and unlikely places to find fossils, which is what. My colleagues and I and I have been doing for all our careers. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it is remarkable, and it's remarkable how it still goes on, right? And as we have new technology and as we have new things, we can, you know, really scientists can really solidify some of the ideas and hypotheses, etc. Um, yeah, there's been. I, mean, I just add to that. Actually, you talk mm-hmm. about new technologies. We are mm-hmm. living in a scientific revolution, right? Um, that is, new imaging technologies are allowing us to see inside rocks in ways we couldn't before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and as a, so that allow gives us access to all sorts of new data, which we didn't, you know, which we didn't have. Mm, yeah, and you know, that's I mean, again I, one of the the beauties of of technology. Uh, in in the book, I think it's in, in your inner fish. You talk about this really cool way of understanding um, fossils in terms of in in past, right? So you talk about how. Um, things with heads, right? Kind of all the way in the past history and, and, and lower rocks, I guess you could say. And then as you get to younger rocks, you have, you know, rocks uh, with, you know, with heads and the people, you know, animals and uh, different organisms and being bipedal and things like that. So just kind of walk us through like how we understand that uh, the older the rocks, uh, what it looks like, what kind of fossils we find as we get to more recent rocks, I should say, or younger rocks, how there's even more of a, a detailed um, uh, kind of anatomy or, or things from sure. various organisms. Well, the creatures with the first bodies composed of many cells appear in the fossil record before the first creatures with skulls and skeletons, right? We know that. And that's starting about 600 million years ago, you start to see creatures with bodies, actually a little deeper in time now. Um, there's been some discoveries that push that back a little further. So for a long period of time, you had only creatures with single cells, and there's a lot of evolution going in metabolisms. Then you had creatures composed of bodies, which had many cells. Then you had creatures with bodies with many cells that had skeletons with skulls, Mm -hmm. right? Then you had creatures with bodies that had skeletons with skulls and fins. (laughs) Then you had creatures, you know, you you just layer it in, then Mm -hmm. creatures with limbs, then creatures with... um, uh, with uh, with jaws and, and you know, creatures with uh, uh, creatures with uh, um, uh, eggs that can reproduce on land, uh, creatures that are you know ultimately have a mammalian style ear, and creatures that are you know big brained and bipedal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there is a succession in the fossil record at, at a large scale. Mm-hmm. That is, you can see the assembly of the you know bodies uh, over time. We're looking at you know, sort of deeper in time, you see sort of more primitive features and, and more recently you see some, you know, you see sort of more specialized features. Um, and that's pretty remarkable um, that you can see that. And so we can actually use those tools to make predictions of where to look for fossils. 
Mm. You know, so once I know that series, mm -hmm. right, then I can make predictions. Okay, I'm, I'm going to find maybe I'm going to find the first creatures with limbs mm. in a particular age rock and a particular, you know, mm. in a particular kind of rock. And that's kind of what we do. Yeah, I think you mentioned that there's there are three major. I mean, there's plenty of places, but three major places: Greenland, the Arctic, and even in in Appalachia and in, in, in uh, Western Central Pennsylvania. How do we? I'm sure there's other locations as well, but how do we understand that there's kind of these central locations of places where we can find really good uh, right. evidence in the fossil record? So for this, you're talking specifically about the transition from life and water to life mm -hmm. on land. Mm -hmm. So for that transition. We knew from other discoveries made over a century by other researchers that likely the right age of rock to look in would be rocks that are roughly around 375, 380 million years old for an intermediate creature. And I mean, it's a rough estimate, sure, but it's a sure. good enough one to sort of begin to look. The next thing we knew is that the most likely rocks to hold those fossils were rocks that were formed in ancient rivers, streams, estuaries, near shore t environments, you know, the places that, cr that creatures with early sort of limbs, they're not gonna be in the deep ocean, right? in the mm -hmm. ancient deep ocean. They're gonna be on the margins or in the rivers and streams. So we knew we wanted rocks that were formed in those environments. And so that basic, and we knew rocks that were, we wanted rocks that were accessible. So those are the three rules that we use, rocks of the right age to answer the question. Mm -hmm. So in this case, they're about 375, 380 million years old, rocks um, of the right type to hold fossils, uh, and then finally, rocks that are accessible and exposed to the surface. You apply those three filters, right? Boom, 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 to say North America, and then three areas just pop up, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's three major ones. So there are a couple other smaller ones, but three big ones. One is in Eastern North America. It's called the Catskill area, and it essentially runs from Appalachia to uh, through Pennsylvania and into New York State. Uh, another is in East Greenland. And then another one, which is we, the one we've been working on, is up in the Canadian Arctic, uh, right. in the high Arctic islands of Canada. Mm. And this is where you found, no, I'm not going to say this right. What is the discovery of the uh, of the, uh, the, the or is Yeah, yeah. This is where you found this wonderful uh, creature. So, I mean, I know it's you and your team that really kind of, you know, really were big on this. I mean, just tell us about it and why it's significant and what it was like to kind of discover that. Sure. There's um, so, you know, it, like anything, it's teamwork, right? So sure, you have sure. to assemble a team, you know, and so it's um, and I was really privileged to have to work with an amazing team that found it. The um, so we knew we wanted rocks. You know, so we were working rocks in the Canadian Arctic and there are rocks that were formed in ancient rivers and streams. There are rocks that were 375 million years, like at right age, right type. And we knew when you didn't have ice or tundra, the rock will be exposed to the surface because we had satellite photos. We had aerial photos. So we had all those types of information at our disposal. So that's what we did. You know, so you know, the Arctic's a big place and Tiktaalik is very small. <laughs> so we, you know, how do you know where to look, right? So and that's kind of how I felt in the beginning days. I was like, oh man, how are we gonna do this? It took us a while, it took us six years, right? And so um, we began in one part of the Arctic, it didn't work out. We were in the wrong kind of rocks, the weather was terrible. We went to a different part of the Arctic. We got closer. We felt, well, okay, we're in the right rock now. We're finding fossil fish, but not the right kinds of fish. Then we changed our search image to look it up in a different part of the Arctic, which had um, rocks formed in ancient rivers and streams, but they were the right kind of streams flowing gently that would preserve whole skeletons. And that's when we started to find fossils. But it's a process, right? It's like sure. trial and error, trial and error. And you learn from your mistakes and you had, you know, we had five years of learning from from our mistakes until the sixth when we found it. Mm. And so, I guess for 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 listeners, I mean, obviously they can read your book, but just briefly, why was this so important? What was so unique about this discovery, and why is it so important for understanding life, but but uh, just for for that transition period? Sure. Like if I was to hold Tiktaalik rosea in front of you, you'd see a creature about uh, four feet long, right, mm. a meter and a half, meter and change, um, and you know it would have scales in its back and fins with fin webbing. Uh, and you'd say, well, it's a fish. Yeah, I got it, it's got fins, it's got scales, you know? And it's got you know, fishy texture to the bones of the skull. It's, it has sort of other fishy traits as well. I mean, and there's a lot, of, a lot of details to it. But you'd say, wait a minute, it looks like a land living animal at the time because it has a flat head with eyes on top. It has a neck, no fish has a neck. And when you open up the fin, what does it have? It has bones that correspond to upper arm, forearm, even parts of a wrist and maybe even digits. And so, but I probably not digits, but, but even parts of a wrist inside the fin, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, so, and it also had sort of muscle structures. You can see sort of muscle scars and ridges and so forth on the humerus, the upper arm bone and radius and ulna, the forearm bones that it suggested it was, it was very powerful to be able to use those appendages to stand and walk about. So it's showing us, so there's a couple lessons here. I mean, actually there's three lessons. Hmm. Lesson number one is we didn't find it by accident. We used the tools of evolutionary biology and stratigraphy mm -hmm. to find it, right? We made a specific prediction and we worked like crazy over six years to <laughs> test that prediction, right? Um, and the, the next is that it shows us the sequence of stages by which features of, of, of tetrapods, of limbed animals, land living animals evolved. And finally, um, it shows us something about ourselves. That is, this neck we see for the first time in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins is something that's become our own neck. Mm. This wrist, which we see for the first time in Tiktaalik in the fins of Tiktaalik and our evolutionary cousins, is something that's to become our own wrist. Mm. So every time you bend your head, every time you bend your wrist, you can thank fish evolving in streams 375 million years ago. And I think so all those lessons, I think, are very powerful and very beautiful, right? Um, and I think that's that's kind of what the fossil record can do for us. And, you know, other fossils at other time periods do similar things, albeit in different ways. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the things that you kind of when you talk about this in the book and then as you go you know forward and, and throughout the book and you you kind of go throughout you know in terms of you know uh, skeletal hands and wrist and then you know heads and skulls and then we get to bodies and things like that it, you you use this kind of way of saying like here's how uh, other organisms fish uh, and then as we go through the the fossil record of here's how there's all of these things that are are kind of consistent right and so we can talk about some of those but and it's it's interesting to think about how many times people make a big deal about how humans are very closely related to certain types of primates and things like that but in actuality in terms of it sounds like structurally we have there's so much continuity with many organisms on the planet and this is uh this finding is it um, i don't know if you would call it an intermediary species but it seems like a really key uh animal for kind of making that bridge between um, not having these things as in process to having a type of structure like a wrist or a hand or a, ske a skeleton or, or a head, et cetera. That's right. It's an intermediate form in many ways. That is, it has features of both groups, right? Mm -hmm. We'd call it more of a fish because it has fins, mm -hmm. but it's um, but that becomes at some point level a matter of definition, right? But mm -hmm. the, the thing to run with a, a topic that you brought up is, you know, we always talk about our relationship to uh, primates, right? Mm -hmm. But we have a relationship to mammals. We have a rela other mammals. We have a relationship to reptiles. We have a relationship to birds. We have a relationship to amphibians, fish, worms, mm -hmm. jellyfish, microbes. We're deeply connected to the rest of life on our planet, in, in, in us. And so inside of our own bodies, we have artifacts of three of billions of years of the history of life. Right. And we see those artifacts. We see that when we look at genes, development, embryos, and find fossils like Tiktaalik, which show us the intermediate stages. Mm. And Tiktaalik is just one pit stop there, right? It's just the fishy sure. one. Sure. I, I want to jump to, I guess, uh, skulls, right? We could talk about many different pieces, but I want to jump to skulls because you talk about plates, blocks, and rods and how you, we see that in fish and in other animals, but then also when our skull is, is form, formulating. So kind of along that thread of what you're describing, just say kind of in how heads are kind of evolved. Um, how do we see so much like continuity structurally with all of these different uh, animals? Yeah, so if you know, if you look at a human skull, it's it actually is pretty complicated in there. There's a lot of anatomy. So when I used to teach human anatomy to the medical students here, you know, we'd say there's as much anatomy from the neck up as there is from the neck down. Mm -hmm. And the difference is also in the head. There is uh, lots of uh, there are those structures are all packed tightly, you know, and there's a three dimensional relationship among them that can be somewhat complex. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the skull. Uh, the skull has different kinds of bones in it, and I called them plate blocks and rods. So, so you know, the plates are on the top of the head here. They cover the brain. The blocks are underneath the brain. They hold the, the brain case. They hold it in there. Mm -hmm. And then the rods form in development, and parts of them are our jaws and other bones as well. Now, what's the utility of understanding all that stuff? Let me just take the rods. Now, here's the deal. If I look at a human um, embryo a few weeks after conception, mm -hmm. right? And I look at the head area, what I'll see is paired primordia for the eyes, like little blobs there, just mm -hmm. about beginning to develop little out pockets of the brain, actually. Mm -hmm. Then I'll find a series of four swellings 
in with the pharyngeal area, in the throat area, right? When it comes to throat area, four swellings. Those four swellings are filled with cells, and uh, they are separated from one another by a little cleft. Mm. Okay, so you can look at them and you say, well, wait a minute, that's kind of cool. If you look at sharks, what do you see? Yeah, the embryo doesn't look identical, but guess what? It has the paired primordia for the eyes, and it's got those swellings as well with the clefts between them. Then you can ask, well, what do those cells become in sharks and fish? Well, those cells become uh, portions of the upper and lower jaw, and then the gill apparatus, as well as the, all the muscles and nerves and bones that control all that stuff. Mm. In humans, what do those swellings become? The first one becomes part of our lower jaw and two bones in our middle ear. So that corresponds to gill structures in sharks and fish. Mm -hmm. uh, the other becomes uh, a, a throat bone, called a part of a throat bone called a hyoid and one bone in the middle ear. And the other two become parts of our voice box. Mm -hmm. So the plates, blocks, and rods, these are the, these are the rods. Um, they're showing our connection to fish in such a beautiful way, right? So the structures and cells that will make the rods in fish become parts of the gill apparatus. Mm -hmm. In us, they become parts of the jaw and ear and voice box. So what does that mean? It means many of the muscles and nerves and bones I'm using to talk to you with right now, hmm. and many of the muscles and nerves and bones you're using to hear me with right now correspond to gill structures in sharks and fish. And we know that because we can compare the cells and the embryos that do that. Mm -hmm. We can look at the DNA that controls all that stuff and show similarities in it. Mm -hmm. And we can look at the fossil record to show continuity, the tie between our ear bones and gill bones if we trace them back in time. <laughs> so it's like, that's why I love it. It's like multiple mm -hmm. lines of evidence coming together uh, to tell us this super surprising yet wonderful story. Is this something that is, I mean, you're, you're piecing it together in a very, you know, kind of coherent way. I mean, other people had to have realized this or seen this in history as well, but maybe it was just not the complete picture or, or how did this kind of just oh. historically come to play? Oh, historically, this is a classic story. I didn't invent the story. Sure, so sure. Um, this is, yeah, so no, no, no. This is um, this is a story that has roots in German anatomy done by sort of German embryologists uh, in the 1800s. Uh, there were some, a bunch of British um, comparative anatomists at the turn of the century, as well as up to the 1920s that did it. And there were a number of labs, including my own, that look at the DNA uh, portion of it as well. So you, know, you think about multiple lines of evidence coming together. It's actually those lines of evidence have have sort of deep roots in the past as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the past of science. Mm -hmm. uh, I think probably similar to this is you also talk about in the, in the human, uh, I believe head is the four arches, right? I think this is, I don't That's know. That's what I was just talking about. The, yeah, the rod, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy because I remember reading in the book about how you see it in all these different animals and it's like, how is it like you see it in the embryos and then how it just, it branches out and how it, when it's fully developed and then how it just, there's this like almost, I want to, I want to say almost a system uh, that just kind of this process that goes into place and depending on the organism, it's going to play out in different ways, which is, you know, how, what other ways could you explain that? Right. Like, how could you not see, it's just almost, how could you not see evolution in those things? Right. And obviously you don't want to do a kind of just so kind of thing, but it almost seems too obvious in some ways. It's incredible. It's a beautiful continuity that you see. It definitely is. And uh, it's one of the great, um, great stories of comparative anatomy. Um, that's been told. In fact, we, I love teaching it to undergraduates. It's because it's, it just shows how you can make surprising connections among creatures. I mean, I'm comparing our jaw to a gill bone and a shark, right? You know, <laughs> right. I mean, right. you know, come on. Right. Or, or our ear bone to a gill bone of a shark. So yeah, I mean, there's so much, it's so rich uh, in there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you can see it so vividly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, just two parts on, on the, in terms of the, the head, right. In terms of at least for humans and then what you finding the continuity, which is eyes and ears. Many times people will see how complex the human eye is. Um, you, you talk a little bit about, about the eye and then also the ear, right? There's the significance of the middle ear for, for animals and how it manages balance for us. So maybe just talk about some of the, the things, kind of the continuity that we see for eyes. You mentioned with the, the, uh, <laughs> the animal that uh, you had uh, found was that the eyes were on the top of the head, not on the side. Um, obviously, we have eyes that are um, kind of kind of sunken into to the front of our face. How how is it that it is with eyes that how they develop over uh, different organisms and through time? What's the continuity there with eyes? Oh, well, there's a continuity at several different stages there. So um, one of the really kind of most um, surprising and compelling um, uh, levels of continuity lies in the genes that control the development of eyes. Mm. So there's, um, there are mutants in humans and mice where there's a mutation 
genetic mutation where individuals don't have retinas or eyes, hmm. uh, mostly not retinas. Um, and there's a mutation in flies where um, creatures are born without eyes. Hmm. And re researchers working in the 1990s discovered that the underlying source of those mutations in mammals like people and in flies are similar genes. They're different names, but they're kind of the same gene in different creatures. Mm -hmm. Such that what they discovered is that when you take the protein that that gene makes, the genes you know code for protein, mm -hmm. when you take the protein that that makes and you you know inject it on a fly, it will induce an eye wherever you inject it on so the wild. wing, on the leg. So wild. So <laughs> yeah, wild. it was pretty wild. That was really kind of a fun to read, but it gets better if you take the human protein and inject it into a fly what happens it'll make an eye <laughs> that's too so, wild yeah so the continuity there is pretty darn amazing even though the flies have a compound eye and we have a camera eye mm -hmm. you know the flies have that compound sort of insect eye we have a, an eye that functions with a you know a lens with the light is projected on the retina which is sort of a screen you know that kind of thing um the very different eyes the genes that control them the master mm -hmm. control gene what we call the master regulator no, it's very similar. Um, so we see that uh, in eyes. We also see continuity in eyes <clears throat> in the proteins mm -hmm. that turn light energy into nervous impulses in the cells. Mm -hmm. They're called opsins. Mm -hmm. So basically what you have are these proteins in the retina, right, in our eye. And when light hits those proteins, it causes a change in the protein, which produces a change inside the cell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's taking light to make a change inside the cell, which then you know, produces a nervous signal that goes to the brain, which is interpreted as, you know, an image. Um, those opsins, those proteins, those, those, those visual proteins, they're seen in other creatures too. They're not just in humans. They're in primates, they're in mammals, they're in reptiles, they're in fish, they're in, you know, in insects, they're, you know, they're infecting versions of them or even seen um, versions of them were seen in microbes. So, um, um, yeah, so that's pretty amazing that you have that deep yeah. continuity to those different parts of the eye. Um, but you can see it again and again, the lens proteins, things like that, um, most definitely in the genetic part. Ears are very similar. <coughs> Excuse me. Ears, uh, there's three parts to the ear, right? There's the outer ear, the part you can wiggle, mm -hmm. and the middle ear where there's three little bones um, with muscles. Mm -hmm. And then there's the inner ear where all the neural magic happens, where the mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the organs that control that perceive balance and acceleration as well as sound mm -hmm. that they sit, right? Outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. Well, there's continuity to that too. Now, the outer ear, the, that is a sort of a more, the most recent mm -hmm. addition to the ear. That's really kind of only a mammalian thing, mm -hmm. right? That, that kind of flap. There are other, some versions of it out there, but it's really kind of most mammalian. The, um, the middle ear, however, those three middle ear bones that sit inside the middle ear, those have a continuity too. They, um, uh, uh, one of those bones, we can trace all the way to sharks and fish. Two of those bones, we can trace to jaw bones of reptiles. <laughs> and we do that from the fossil record. We have series that show how the bones in the back of the jaw of a reptile become smaller and smaller and smaller until they become middle ear bones in them. Um, and then we go to the inner ear. Components of that are seen in frogs and fish and sharks. Um, and there's a, you know, the, the, there's a the structures in there that hold these things called hair cells, which, <clears throat> which, um, which when they bend, send a neural signal to the brain that's either recorded as sound or balance. Those are also seen, you know, in deep continuity and connection with other creatures. So it's the same story in different parts of the, each system. Well, it's, it's also interesting too, just kind of from a, uh, uh, going back to what we were saying earlier is it, with the eyes, you're talking about the DNA and the genetic uh, uh, data that we can find to understand about eyes. And then you're, I mean, you can find it with everything, but I'm just how you were describing it. But then we can also look at the fossil record for ears, right? And of course you can do this for both, but it's just interesting to see how the different tools that we have with the different technology, technological advances we make, where there's this combination of how do we understand genetics? And then how do we continue to still use the fossil record and having those two together along with other methods is uh, super powerful to have a more robust and complete understanding of uh, evolution, uh, different organisms, and then for ourselves as well. So it's, it's really, really nice compliment there. Yeah, I mean, so like for eyes, you know, they're mostly soft tissue, right? So we don't find a whole lot of eyes in the fossil record, at least in vertebrate organisms, organisms in the skulls. 
uh, we can find them in trilobites and things like that, but um, uh, like a human kind of eye, they don't usually make it in the fossil record. There are some, but not mm -hmm. a lot. Um, the, uh, whereas the ear, the inner ear, the middle ear, you can actually find that in the fossil record because they're made of bone, mm -hmm. you know, and then you, you tend to, that tends to fossilize better. So, but the, the genetics give us, you know, a whole different, you know, since we have lots of living creatures that have those genes, we can compare mm -hmm. them. So again, it's complementary data, you know, it all, all fits together. Mm -hmm. At the end of uh, your inner fish, you get this really nice graphic, which is uh, kind of like a long human family tree, right? Which is, you know, you kind of, we have obviously unicellular organisms, but when you start with kind of some of the first multicellular organisms, I think in the book, you have a, like jellyfish, and then you just get to, then there's the body and the skulls and hands and feet, and then the three bone middle ear, and then bipedalism and large brains, and you just kind of give this like tree of like, yeah, we're all connected, right? This is kind of the big, big family tree. You know, how do, how do we, I guess in one way, right? You know, how do we make some kind of, I don't want to say value or meaning to it, but how do we, in understanding that connectedness, right? And you're tangibly showing how there's connectedness there. You know, how, what is the, the major, I guess, importance of understanding that kind of evolutionary history of, of, um, of various multicellular organisms? Well, it's, a, it's actually a beautiful thing because the, um, well, think about a family tree. Think about our own family trees, mm -hmm. our biological family. Mm -hmm. So if I know our, my own biological family tree, um, you know, and I know my aunts and uncles and cousins and how they're all related and distant cousins, and let's say I have a, a big tree, mm -hmm. and I know their family history of disease, I know their genes, I can make predictions about what I'm susceptible to Sure. You know, certain diseases, right? useful information in that tree, knowing that, that genealogy, right? Well, that tree of life extends to other species. And, you know, once you know the of life, you can begin to make predictions yeah. about what species have. You can also show how our bodies were assembled over time. That is, you can see in that tree which features were acquired when, mm. you know, or which features were lost when. Mm -hmm. It gives you the sequence by which our bodies were built or the bodies of any, my boy talk about us, the bodies of any creature were built, sure. you know? Um, and that's really powerful stuff, right? Because what you're seeing is, you know, how is the world made? How are bodies made? How are they assembled? And what were the forces that assembled those bodies? What happened on the planet as those bodies were assembled, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And so having a tree, a genealogy, if you will, is a, is a starting point for all that kind of, to give access to all that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, I think it's it's important. I think is also important for maybe for some folks, you know, where it's like, you know, where there is a kind of, you know, it's kind of sanctity of life, right? All life, it, there is a connectedness there. I think that is, you know, really, really important. I'm going to skip to your, some of the content from your next most, I guess I should say most recent book, Some Assembly Re Required. This is your most recent, right? You haven't. I it is. Yeah, it came out uh, last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also really, really cool. This one has more historical components. So kind of the, the German, uh, researchers you mentioned was some of that, their stories in here. Um, but some assembly required, which was super cool. One of the things that really stuck with me from the, from the beginning of the book was where you talk about the, the five words from, of, uh, of Darwin, which was really, really interesting how you, you kind of use that to kind of build off for the rest of it, which was, uh, the phrase was by a change of function. Uh, so could you just kind of unpack that a little bit of what Darwin meant and how you kind of use that in the book of, uh, by a change of function, um, and how that helps us understand the, kind of these building blocks of, uh, of, of how life's made. Well, if you think about how evolution works, you can either evolve by making new structures, right? Evolve a new gene to make a new structure that does something new, mm -hmm. right? That's one way of happening. Or the other way is to use old structures in new ways, mm. repurpose them, mm -hmm. right? Well, a lot of evolution happens in both ways, but it turns out in the sort of the big jumps in evolution, it turns out a lot of it is using old stuff in new ways. Mm. That is, you know, if you think like that lungs arose, came about as creatures evolved to walk on land or that feathers arose, you know, as creatures evolved to fly, you'd be in really, really good company. Mm. You'd also be entirely wrong. And we've known that for over a century. <laughs> and the reason is those features all appeared well before lungs appeared eons before the first creatures ever took steps on land. Lungs were one of their very early features. I mean, lungs arose in fish 
that lived in water, but that water had um, um, variable oxygen content. So they would use both lungs and gills. They'd use the lungs when the oxygen content of the water was low. Um, so lungs were already around. They were used in fish living in water so that when the time came where it was useful for them to walk on land, they already had the stuff. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to evolve anything new. They just had to, you know, redeploy, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with feathers. Feathers arose first in dinosaurs. <laughs> and, you know, for a variety of reasons, not for flight, you know, for courtship displays, for thermoregulation, things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were already there when creatures began to fly. So, you know, so that's the key thing. I think, you know, a change in function means that you don't always have to evolve lots of new structures to do new things. You can use your old structures to repurpose them to do new things. That's huge because it makes all these giant changes in evolution much, much more simple to happen. You don't have to wait for bazillion mutations to be able to walk on land. All you have to be is a fish that already has lungs and has fins that can prop up the body and you're, you're almost good to go. Yeah, it's it's absolutely marvelous to think about that, right? Like, I think if 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 listeners like you know just contemplate that, right? There's there's a certain organs or certain parts of an organism that can potentially do uh, multiple functions. They could do multiple things potentially, right? I guess the question there is: Is this uh, in terms of this ability to change the function? Is from what we know now, is that a combination of uh, genes in the environment. So as you're evolving, and as you're evolving in different environments over time, um, and as there's different genetic components, what makes that change of function, right? What, where is that kind of switching of like, okay, now we're gonna, you have these parts for here, and we're using it this way, but over time, now it's going to be this way. How, how does I guess some of the mechanics? Oh, DNA is always changing. So DNA mm -hmm. is always changing in every gen. Every time you get a, you know, DNA molecule makes a copy of itself it makes mistakes right sure. and so those mistakes are, are you, know, you pile up and some of those mistakes can drive new features right so that's one way of getting the change you know um but you don't need a whole lot of that sometimes if you can use your old structures in new ways and that just sets you up in a new direction then you can have evolution going in, in its old you know in the normal way and not that i shouldn't say normal way that in the way that most people are familiar with sure you know yeah uh, you mentioned it earlier. I was just curious about it. One of the things that was so convincing for me uh, when learning about evolution was embryonic work, right? I think uh, that's it's when you see, I mean, that's just a, a very, at least for me, at least, you can just see it, right? At least with mammals, you could see it. It's like we literally all have pretty much the same same way of doing things, right? That's the, There's the continuity there. So you, you talk about uh, Bonnet and you talk about uh, Haeckel's uh, embryo comparisons. Why was that helpful at that time to understand the evolution of, of mammals in particular? Well, they compared embryos by, because, you know, basically the idea is that um, uh, the mo one of the most important people is, is uh, Carl Armstrong Bear. And he um, is slightly before Heckel and slightly after Bonnet. Um, he, um, he was basically comparing embryos. And he basically showed that, like, you know, you compare a human to a turtle to a fish. When you, when you compare them like an adult of each, they look really different. Mm -hmm. But when you start to compare the embryos, those, a lot of those differences start to break, start to break down. So there are much more you know, general similarities among the embryos of these creatures. I mean, they can be different in some ways, but there's, there's fewer of those differences in embryos than there are um, among the adults. Mm -hmm. And so basically what the comparison of embryos showed is similarities that would have been hidden if you only compared the adults, right? Because mm -hmm. you're seeing commonalities of different tissues um, in embryos that in adults is, is masked by all the changes that have happened during later development. What what is it? I guess that with okay. Let me let me introduce this piece of it. You can just kind of give the brief version of it. But the introduction here of uh, DNA, genes, proteins, just kind of over, kind of a brief overview. I mean, obviously, it's a lot of parts and very complex. But how do we understand that every single body cell has some sequences of DNA? And how do we understand genes in general to understand some of these ways in which there could be change of function or 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 a new function? So what, so let's just take our own body. So we have what, let's say we have, I don't know the exact number, but let's just say we have 25 trillion cells in our body. I'm giving you a number, it could be 35 for all I know. <laughs> sure, um, sure. But I mean, say we have 25 trillion cells in our body. Um, and each of those cells has a nucleus inside. So we have 25 trillion nuclei. Um, and inside that nucleus is the DNA, 
all wrapped up, wrapped up. So basically you have a six foot long strand of DNA that's wrapped up in on itself inside the nucleus of every single one of those 25 trillion cells. So if I took your DNA and I unwrapped it in each cell, all 25 trillion of them, and laid it end to end, it would go from here to Pluto. Okay, that's how much DNA, and that's how much DNA is in our bodies, right? And so, yeah, it's pretty mind-blowing. And so <clears throat> that is um, powerful stuff, because um, that's a lot of information inside of us. Now, our cells have the, pretty much the same, our body cells have pretty much the same DNA inside them. So the cells inside um, your arm bone, the bone of your arm, and the cells inside a nerve cell in the brain, and the cell inside, the cells inside like an intestinal cell, um, and cells inside a skin cell, they have the same DNA inside. Mm. You know, it's largely the same, mm. right? What's different is which genes are turned on and off, which genes are active. That's the piece. Mm. So it's the activity of the genes, right? Mm. That makes those tissues different. So understanding a lot of changes in evolution and development means understanding what causes changes to the activity in DNA in the cell, right? Mm. So I want to understand the difference between, say, a skin cell and a um, and say a bone cell at the genetic level, I want to know uh, which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off, mm. and what's doing that. That's the piece, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's the you know that's the interesting piece. And so that's called you know that's called gene regulation, and a lot of people are studying the regulation, regulatory interactions of genes mm. um, uh, during development, and that because that'll give you a sense of you know what are, what are the kinds of mutations that can bring about major changes. Mm. In the in the book, you talk about. <laughs> This uh, sonic hedgehog gene, which I, I, I thought about my youth and, and playing the game and all, <laughs> all of that. And so to describe the sonic hedgehog gene, uh, what it is and, and why it's important. Well, sonic is a gene. It was actually named after the Sega Genesis video game. I, was it really? Uh, I believe so. Um, in the 90s. You know, so that was the, the discovery. That was the heyday. Named it that. that was the heyday. Yeah, exactly. Um, the gene it makes a protein like every other, you know, good old gene. And um, it's active in a lot of different tissues. It's, it's kind of a master toolkit gene for building different parts of the body. It's present mm -hmm. in, yeah, all throughout the body. Um, and, but where, you know, where, you know, a lot of people associated with, it's actually present in early limbs mm -hmm. as well. And so you see sonic activity, the gene sonic, it's active in the limb bud before digits appear, before fingers and toes appear. And it's active as a little patch in one side of the limb, okay? Turns out if you activate sonic on the other side of the limb, make another patch, and there's lots of molecular ways to trick cells into doing that, you make a, a, a duplicate hand. <laughs> instead of, you know, instead of, let's say, make a chick with three digits, you make a chick with six, you know? <clears throat> and it does so in a very specific way. So what sonic does is it interacts, it, it, it secretes, a, it makes a protein, which diffuses in the in the uh, in the limb bud interacts with a lot of other genes to make digits is mm. what it's doing and it tells digits what to be be digit one two three or four mm. so it's a, it can instruct it in that way and it turns out sonic is present in lots of different types of appendages it's present in limbs with fingers and toes it's also present in fins you know mm. instructing the fins to, you know which is front and which is back kind of mm -hmm. thing so it's a wonderful um, gene. Uh, to understand and so sonic to understand it also and here we're going to take it a little deeper level that is um, what controls the activity of sonic when and where it's active are little stretches of dna that are like switches they're turned on or off so if the switch is on then sonic will be made in a tissue if the switch is off then sonic will not be made in the tissue right i'm simplifying it a lot sure. but that's kind of at this level of discussion that's kind of the key. Sure. um so it turns out that a lot of those mutations you see, which were, were, were creatures might have more digits or fewer digits, happen in that switch area. So mutations in that switch area control the activity of sonic. So yeah, so it's an amazing gene. And it's really been important for understanding lots of uh, facets of development, including you know, um, developmental uh, anomalies uh, seen in, in multiple creatures. I guess the uh, question on that is, is how do the genes switch on and off, you know, kind of colloquially say, do there, is there, there's no one pulling the lever there, right? I mean, well, natural selection? Molecules. 
No, no, there are molecules that are pulling that level during development. So there are lots of molecules okay. that are talking to one another. The DNA is opening and closing. It's a whole process that's orchestrated at the molecular level, mm -hmm. usually in response to cell signaling and so forth. So think about mm -hmm. cells are talking to one another you know, with proteins, and those proteins are controlling the DNA. I mean, it's, it's a whole sort of network, a sort of uh, software, molecular software that's controlling the activity of the gene. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's really powerful stuff how there's so much of that in all organisms, but including the human body and how all of that works that, you know, each person comes out, you know, relatively, uh, you know, <laughs> healthy and normal and, and how, how it's able to function yeah. that way. It's, it's, it's a really, lot has to happen for that. It's yeah, amazing. Exactly. It's amazing. I uh, want a few more questions here. I want to ask about the important significance of someone like uh, Mar Margulis. Is this right? And her ben Margulis, yeah, yeah, and her contribution to science. It was someone I didn't know. And reading your book, I, I was like, oh, this is really, really uh, interesting, and it's nice to to learn about people that you know that you don't usually hear about. And so, what was her contribution to science and furthering our understanding of cellular biology and and and, and the like? Well, Margulis. Um was quite an iconoclast and a brilliant one at that. She, um, she, so she revealed that evolution can happen by joining creatures together, symbiosis. Mm. That is, you, so you don't always have to have mutation in evolution, but sometimes that different species can cooperate and merge to become a new creature. So she sh showed that complex cells like the ones in our body, which have a nucleus and organelles and so forth, actually came about by the merger of two different microbes in the distant past. And when she, she came up with that theory and it was largely ignored or derided hmm. and it was rejected from like 15 journals. Um, she proposed the theory, it was kind of like, uh, you know, the stuff of people just giggling under their breath for a, a period of time. Um, and then, um, then when molecular technology came out, they were able to show pretty conclusively that really the cells in our bodies, complex cells in our bodies, uh, actually came about the merger of two different kinds of uh, bacteria in the distant mm. past. Mm. So it's showing that evolution come about by new combinations of things, mm. not just uh, not just uh, you know mutation and selection things like that. Mm. I guess that so much of your research and so much of the things that you've studied and that you've written about in you know all of your wonderful books is about the human body and how it's made and again a lot of these uh, consistencies here or, or lack thereof in some parts i guess what do we say about where we're at in modernity and the future of the human body right so not necessarily about age or things like that but now we have many synthetic ways of doing things right obviously we've had for a while now heart transplants and people have you know get brand new knees and how does that i guess over time um you know, kind of impacts, you know, what, what the human body is becoming or what it is. And, you know, where do you just see, I guess, the future of the evolution of the human body? Well, it's huge. They are us and we are them, right? So, um, no, it's, 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 it's like we are. So basically what you have is we're an inventing species, right? Mm. We make stuff. We have cultural practices. We make medicines and devices. We have educational practices and so forth. And they become part of our bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, think about it. We uh, and you know, human populations invented agriculture, growing wheat, and, you know, domesticating cows for milk. Well, that changed our own genome. So yeah. there is an idea, you know, that and then we adapted to agriculture, right? So mm -hmm. we have in us, you know, the signature of human ideas. Yeah. Well, um, you know, so by, so culture and biology are sort of the yin and the yang of us, you know, mm -hmm. and and us going forward, and. Um, Right. So, you know, you think about so many different things. I'm wearing glasses. I'm near blind from nearsightedness, right? I wouldn't have made it to 11 years old living on a Savannah plane, right? <laughs> so, the con so the condition I have would have been fatal three million years ago, yeah. but it's kind of meaningless now, you know, just cost me some money for some glasses. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the same is true, like you said, heart transplants and drugs and antibiotics and, mm -hmm. and things like that, vaccines. And all those things, they become part of us. And, and so, you know, when you think about the human future and like what's going to drive the, mm -hmm. our performance, how long we live, our cognitive capacity, our strength and so forth, you know, maybe Darwinian selection, but it's going to be a lot of human ideas and knowledge and cultural practices 
that are gonna that are gonna affect our bodies, you know, in the coming centuries and millennia. The um, but that leads to another issue is that you know disparities in access to these technologies will drive disparities in humans. Hmm. So we have a whole new problem that you know acts. It's not just technology, but access to technology is extremely important. You know, for um, for for humanity. Hmm. Is there is there anything about that that worries you, or anything that uh, is is concerning for you about how we treat the human body, where it's going, maybe the advent of you know better and better and better AI, any of these things that uh, give you <laughs> make no, you lose sleep at night? <laughs> well, like a lot, of, there are like a lot of things you can you know it's these are all two edged swords. Gene editing, for instance, mm -hmm. you know it's 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 going to save a lot of lives. Yeah. But there's other, you know, there are a whole, a lot of, in certain applications, real ethical questions about its use. Mm -hmm. Likewise, it's going to be used in agriculture and it already is in many ways, but there are ethical questions that need to be asked there. And, you know, a lot of this is uh, people just doing natural experiments and kind of living with the consequences. And that's not what we want. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be concerned about, to be quite honest. Um, the, um, uh, you know, look, there's a huge disconnect between the environments that our bodies evolved in and the environments they're in now, yeah. all right? Yeah. You know, we evolved in savannah plains as active animals, and here we are, you know, not in savannah plains and not active, um, living a lot longer, so we have different kinds of diseases. Mm. Um, and also, you know, whenever you invent technologies um, and access them, there is the law of unintended consequences. Sure. Sure. That is, you cannot, you know, you cannot predict all the, the consequences. So I do worry about a lot of that. Um, you know, and yeah, if we're really arrogant about the choices we make, we could be in trouble, right? So, yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. It's interesting to see where it goes. Uh, well, 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 look, Neil, I mean, uh, you're you're absolutely you know prolific in in your writing and in all of your research. Um, you've obviously the the classic your inner fish is great, and your more recent book some assembly required um, is they're all out now, and everyone should pick them up. Are you working on anything new? I mean, I know you're super busy, but uh, any anything new or any ideas for any any new books? Yeah, we got a new book we're working on on, per, on Earth's polar regions and the science around that. Oh, very um, nice. So I'm having nice. fun with that. Yeah, so I'm gotta got working that now. I'm still in the early phases of it, middle stages of it. Um, and yeah, our research is going great. We got, uh, you know, new expeditions, new fossils, yeah, all, all moving ahead. It's exciting stuff. It's really exciting. Well, uh, tell people where they can, you know, I mean, I'm sure they can get their books anywhere now, but where can people find you? Where they can they find your research and look you up and all that wonderful stuff? I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter, you know, just by my, by my name, Neil Shubin. Just, I'm on, I've got an tr active Twitter feed and pretty active, um, reasonably active, uh, depending on my mood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well look Neil this is this is a lot of fun I, um, I want to be respectful of your time so uh, thanks so much for, for coming on and, and talking to us about uh, the body and, and about uh, life on earth and uh, it's all really important stuff so just can't say enough thanks yeah, thank you great to be on alright thank you